So today we have been for session, um, it runs two hours. Um, I changed the topic a little bit. It's still about finding data jobs and with bookend and career services. Um, but I like to expand um, the topic to include all data jobs. So over here, you can see uh, the title becomes you know, become a DA slash BI, DS, DE, machine learning engineer, and DevOps. Um, first of all, this is something we are about to launch, um, most likely in November. So I haven't even had the chance to update the presentation. This is definitely good news. Um, those of you, you know, who know Wicklow Data, you probably know we have been running bookend for quite some time, you know, since um, 2015. And it's always live bookends and after COVID, uh, we uh, went online, but, you know, it's still instructors deliver uh, the courses online uh, with the TS support. And over the years, we discovered that the learning experience is actually not the best. Um, you know, uh, the concept about the live bookend or the benefits of attending a live bookend is you have the opportunity to interact with the instructor. Um, from the past experience, if we have 20, 25 students in one class, most likely, you know, uh, five or six students are the most active and they ask questions when they uh, don't understand when they get stuck. Um, but many students may remain quiet. Um, so it's just go through the three hours and it's not very different from you know, watching the video after it. So we've decided to keep the live bookend. Um, by the same time, we decided to launch and the self-paced, mentor-guided, and recorded bookend. And this can start anytime, which is a learning pass. You know, you can hop on anytime, um, all year round. And uh, for live bookends, um, we usually run four cohorts a year in January, April, July, October. So if you miss one cohort, if you miss one train, you will have to wait three months to catch the next train. But for this new format, you can start anytime because you spend the time watching the recorded bookend and you have to control. At the same time, we enhance the TA support and every student will have, um, you know, 30 or even more TA hours in this normal one. And if you have any specific questions, um, you know, you wouldn't want to ask in class um, in the light bookend then it becomes much, much more safe, <laughs> convenient for you to ask the TA uh, to support you. So you enjoy the benefits of, you know, uh, watching the best quality bookend we will record. At the same time, uh, the learning becomes very personalized. So this is something I want you to notice and the price point, I don't know the exact price, but I think um, I have heard, you know, it's half of the price of the live bookend. And I think the, the learning experience will be um, also good, um, but some of the students, I understand you want um, that environment. For instance, you know, every day um, you need to be, you know, discipline and to go to the lesson 7.30 to 
uh, that's totally fine. You can still attend the live bootcamp and if that's your preference. So this is something that we want you to know about. Uh, I'm going to skip a few uh, a few slides. Go to okay this slide. Um, we want you to know that you know digital transformation uh, represents both software and data, and that has happened um, in most of the economy. I think as the economy and the business goes through big changes and digital transformation, um, everybody you know, is affected. So we as employees, we also need to go through transformation, the same kind of transformation. In fact, I believe as an individual, you're more flexible, more adaptable to new situations. And for big corporations, they may have to, um, you know, uh, take a long time to wake up and respond to the market changes. But for individual, um, you're nimble, you're flexible. And if you see your job is in danger, or if you see yourself in a industry that is sinking, you know, we will jump, you know, we'll go uh, and transition into a different industry in different role. So over here, I want to talk about uh, the data jobs in general. So over here, you can see you know, data analytics, so business intelligence, data science, data engineering, machine learning engineering. Um, if we turn this into job titles, you will see data analysts, business intelligence analysts, um, data scientists, data engineer, machine learning engineer. Um, so this for um, radar charts, and sometimes you call these uh, spider charts. Um, I like it a lot uh, because this show you um, different data rows. They oftentimes work on the same team, but with different emphasis. Um, it really depends on your strengths, your interests, or maybe to some extent, your educational background. Uh, but there's no limitation. We, I have seen you know, people from all kinds of educational background and they move into the data space and they have done different roles without a problem. But still, knowing your options and to make the right decision uh, is important. Um, I want to use this chart to show you that um, if you pay attention, you will notice that uh, different roles, they have uh, the same 11 skills, um, but you know, uh, to different degrees of specialization. So that's why your profile looks different. So we can start from data analysts. Um, you know, going from the middle to uh, five points. So uh, this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, we can just look at the five points, the the, um, the specialization. So for data analysts, uh, data visualization is definitely important. Um, if you have used Tableau, Power BI to build dashboards, uh, this is it, you know, uh, using data to tell a story and using visualization tool to communicate uh, the business insight to the business teams or to help the business team communicate you know, across the organizations. So storytelling is key. So you need to um, communicate to the non-technical audience. Oftentimes you have to speak business and you will use terms like you know, higher revenue, lower cost, um, maybe um, better quality, you know, uh, higher efficiency, less waste. Um, so that kind of uh, things requires you to really know how to communicate you know, with the business team. So business insight, once again, it's about um, the findings and the recommendations and business team, if you do this, 
you're going to you know sell more you know generate more revenue and you know realize more profit and reporting that is your basic uh, responsibility so if you intend to work as a data analyst and you will build all 11 skills but you with special emphasis in data visualization storytelling business insight and reporting i hope you get a fairly good um, or clear picture uh, about what data analysis inta in 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 entails. But for data scientists, uh, you can see that the, the focus sheets. You can see over here stats or mass is important, and machine learning modeling is important, and experimentation. I will explain. Uh, I will explain in a moment. Um, you know, for people coming from um, a strong math background, sometimes you see people with PhD degree uh, in physics and chemistry. You know, they are very strong uh, in math, and so they may, may be good candidates um, for data uh, data scientists uh, roles. Um, and machine learning modeling, that's, um, you know, where you spend most of your time to um, use data to train models. Um, but sometimes uh, data scientists, um, not all data, data scientists are modelers, you know, or you don't spend all your time building models, but sometimes you implement the models. So for instance, experimentation is about how you design a task. Uh, Sometimes we use the term A-B testing, yeah? Um, just to challenge the existing uh, strategy um, until you find uh, a strong challenger and that beat the campaign and you can crown the challenger new campaign, uh, a new, new champion, sorry. So over here you can see, you know, uh, very uh, strong emphasis in stats, modeling, experimentation. Of the data engineer, you can see uh, the focus shifts to building data pipelines. Um, this, you know, you can you can um, consider this uh, the infrastructure. So you're building it's like plumbing inside a house. So you will need to build the plumbing for for the for the data to flow right from source to target, uh, or maybe from uh, databases to data warehouses, and then uh, to um, some other you know, environment where you can build reports and build models. And oftentimes this uh, is on cloud um, because now we need to work with big data. So database skills is definitely critical um, for internal data. You know, most of uh, the companies use uh, SQL database to organize the internal data. So that that is definitely the strong point for a data engineer. For machine learning engineer, once again, whenever you see the title, you know, that includes engineer, it's it's probably more about uh, deployment, uh, implementation, um, you know, to make it happen, right? And machine learning en engineer, and they spend uh, a lot of time, um, you know, um, launch or maybe deploy the model into production environment. And this is machine learning ops operations. So this is day-to-day, -day, you know, real time using a model to um, make recommendation or to, to, to make prediction, okay? So I hope you have a good understanding. Just give me a second. Let me admit three more people to join us. So I hope you have a fairly good understanding of four different roles. I, I know sometimes you're a bit undecided. Um, can I, um, I think data scientist is a big job. You know, some, some of you may think, you know, this is a big job. Can I uh, start with DABI? But once I build a good foundation, and if my interest is still very obvious, I want to become data scientist, um, can I take two steps? Absolutely. You can take two steps. You can take one joint uh, step, you know, a quantum leap. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but sometimes, you know, you see people come in from a uh, non-technical background and they want to become a data engineer and they, they can make it too. But you just need to work harder on programming. So as a data engineer, you will um, program or, or code a lot more. Okay, uh, any questions so far? So let me just check. Okay, we do have one question and for DevOps, if there are a DevOps bookend. Yes, uh, we do have a DevOps bookend. Um, DevOps is development and operations road into one. And once again, that's day-to-day, -day, you know, support and um, maintenance. And it's also about um, uh, iterative, you know, uh, enhancement of the existing models or any data layer, if you will. So DevOps is actually in high demand. Um, you will need to have some skill you know, in cloud computing as well. Um, so data engineer and DevOps um, overlap quite a bit. So this is about building the infrastructure and DevOps is about running it, right? So develop, development and running it. Uh, so if you consider data, en data engineer building the railway, the highway, and uh, you're writing on it, right? Uh, as a DevOps engineer, okay? I hope I get that across, all right? So let me just go to the next slide. And I know the motivation is to get a job in this space. And for people from various backgrounds, uh, I've talked to people you know, from civil engineering, from mechanical engineering, um, you know, sometimes um, I've heard people say data is probably a easier entry point. And if you want to um, build a career that is uh, promising and rising, uh, that is true. You, you can still stay in traditional industry, but if you have the passion for data, and I think this is the time. Um, I think all of you have heard uh, or have experienced the, the, the AI hype. It is coming. It is here to stay. Um, so AI is going to change um, how we work for sure, 100%. So if there's no escape, we might as well you know, ride with it, right? Um, we might as well embrace it. Um, okay, so another question. I am surprised how important experimentation is for machine learning engineers. Uh, are they working on the same sort of experiments as engineers? So, um, right. So let me just uh, go back, go back. Here, machine learning engineer experimentation is four. Is four. So the reason you have this rank is four and data scientist is you know five. Uh, that's because you can design the experiment, the machine learning engineer they they execute it, right? So um, both rows they need to know the methodology you know, and how to design and, and implement a task. And I give you one example. So you can divide the population into the control group and the test group. And there is something called the randomness. You have to make sure you know, if you divide the population into 80% control and 20% test, you have to make sure uh, these two groups, um, they are randomly distributed. So then if the test result is different, you can attribute that result to the different treatment. Uh, so statistically, um, we will have to make sure, you know, this is the case. So both data scientists and machine learning engineer, they will need to 
understand experimentation? I hope I answered that question. <clears throat> okay. All right. So this is about you know getting a job in this data space. So I think everybody is changing name to some extent. Uh, either it's different from what uh, it's different from your training, you know, from your educational background, or it's different from your past experience. So even for uh, new recent graduates from school, um, they need to decide you know, where to go um, from here. And there is a transition. And for people who spent five, 10 years in a different field, if they want to transition into data space, um, that's also a big change. And the resume, you know, appears very weak uh, to, to empower you to make that change. So that's the reason why, you know, we encourage you to build a very strong portfolio. I think these two go hand in hand. Um, the portfolio uh, support the statement. So the, the resume, you are making a statement, you know, I'm capable, I have the skill, and I will succeed in the role. Uh, but the portfolio will show people what you have built, you know, what, what you have accomplished. Or you know, the, portfolio, the portfolio needs to show the quality of the project. It's, it, it's not some kind of, you know, uh, toy project <laughs> or assignments from school. It has to be industry grade. It's, it has to be professional quality. And the hiring manager, the recruiter probably uh, has no idea, but the hiring manager, when, when they see your portfolio in GitHub or uh, in your personal website, and they can immediately see and on what level you're, you're, you're at, okay? So two or more messages, and then you just go down. What about product manager? Oh, that's a really good question, Robin. Very, very good question. Okay, so I'd like you to picture a, a triangle. <laughs> I always use triangle um, to, to describe a team. You know? Um, you know, all triangles are stable right? because it has three sides. So imagine a triangle, on, it has three sides. One side um, is about building the right thing or solving the right problem. And that is product management. You know, that's about uh, scope, you know. And you decide what goes in, what comes out, right? So that's product management. And there is the second side called development. So if it's a software application, then you know that's the de developers, that's the team of de developers to, to build it, to build the thing right, okay? So product manager makes sure you build the right thing and development team, you know, they know how to build it right, okay? And then there is the third uh, side, um, which is to build it fast and that's project management. So, uh, Robin, I'm telling you, you raised a very good question. So as a product manager, you need to be the subject matter expert as well. So at least you need to know the product we're building. So for instance, could be a um, recommendation engine we're building, right? It's not a software, it's not, it's not an application, but it's the brain we're building for Spotify you know, for, for Netflix or maybe for Amazon to um, segment the customer and uh, make recommendations for, for, for individual customers. So as a product manager, I think it's pretty hard if um, you don't have uh, the depths, uh, if you don't know uh, the, the product itself, and um, it's pretty hard for you. So we actually have seen the students who quite some of them, um, they become product manager or business analyst. Uh, business analyst uh, is also about, uh, you know, managing the scope, right? Or, or converting you know, business requirements into 
uh, design document or into functional design. And so the developers uh, or, the, or the, the, the engineers may know um, how to build it. So that's a really good question. So I'm actually finding, so I've been a product manager for a number of years, worked in technology. The jobs I'm seeing right now, they seem to be, they expect you to have as much knowledge as an engineer or a data scientist to be a product manager, when in fact, neither of those roles have really much of any idea what they're building unless you actually lead them through the process, right? Yeah. But having an appreciation of data science is great, but... Yeah. I mean, I can sit down and create models if I want to, classification models, regression, whatever it is, right? But mm -hmm. I spend all my time doing that. I'm never going to be at a point where I can actually create successful products. Mm -hmm. So it gets past, how, how do we determine what the best knowledge is mm -hmm. to be able to persuade? Because if I stand in front of an engineer as a product manager and, that, and I don't, I don't like come across as somebody who's as good as a data scientist and a data and a um, machine learning <laughs> engineer all rolled in one to be a product manager when all yeah. I need to do is actually be able to communicate with them yeah. how can you even get a job you know what I mean <laughs> right uh, 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 this is an important question because nobody knows it all and um, and it's it's unnecessary right so the question is um how um, how much is enough <laughs> for me to work as a product manager? Um, let me just flip this. We have seen product managers, um, they, they probably stay on the business side most of the time, but from time to time, you will need to work very closely you know, with the development team. So it could be the engineering team. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we need to have enough steps to to earn the respect, you know, from the the engineering team. And or when you write a requirements document, or maybe when you convert the requirements into a functional design, you know, when the engineers when they read it, they immediately know what to do, you know, how to code. Yeah. That's the kind of measure. You know, we want to use, and uh, if you know enough, right, to work on the team and um, to make sure uh, the 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 engineering team is building is building the right thing. So there's definitely a problem with between product management and development, though, that um, engineers don't like product managers telling them how to build a product, right? That's down to the engineers, right, and the data scientists in this case. Yes, but. I mean, I'll give you an example. I was working on forecasting modeling, right? Worked with data scientists. We thought it was regression modeling. It turned out to be classification modeling, right? Did I care? No, I'm a product manager. I understand how both works. But they came back and said, we can do it this way. It's like, great, right? But the problem you have is if you have too much knowledge as a product manager, you start trying to tell engineers how to solve the problem. And that's mm -hmm. not what the, what the role is, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out in this environment of, you know, um, machine learning and AI, I, I mean, if I try and walk in the door and try and get another job as a product manager in AI right now or machine learning, it's incredibly hard because they expect you to sit there and start talking about statistics. I mean, what is the point of that? I mean, do you want me to be a data scientist? Because, okay, if I do that, that's one thing, but I don't know, that's my strongest skill set, right? So I'm trying to figure out what is it, to your point, what is enough? What is enough? I mean, I can converse with data scientists. I can converse machine learning engineers. I can sit down and create models. So they, theoretically, these days, you don't even have to create yes. models anymore, right? You just have to implement the right model. It's, so, it, 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 depending on the company and the culture, the people say Steve Jobs is a very good product manager, and he probably is. Um, so, if a company has a very strong engineering culture, even you know, with the engineers driving the company and the, uh, where it's going. Um, I, I, I'm trying to say the product manager and the dev team, they will have to complete the picture, right? Yep. So where you establish the boundary, it really depends on the company. Um, yeah, if, if, if the product manager is very strong, you know, in terms of dictating you know, what to build, uh, but then he will need to convince 
the engineering team. Um, and he will also need to make sure the product vision is understood by the engineering team. Um, so I'd like to move on. And um, there's another question from Bader. I hope I pronounce your name correct. Um, if I'm a beginner in the IT field, um, it's been one year that I'm in it. Um, what advice would you advise? Okay, so first of all, I like to clear a mess you know, or maybe misconception. And data is not IT. So I really want to make um, the distinction between data and IT. Data is not IT and there is application programming and there's also data programming. I, I hope you understand the difference. IT is about building application software. You hear the saying that software is eating the world, which is true. So software is another great space you want to go in, but it requires um, more specialization. Um, as a data professional, you also code, uh, but probably you use programming to collect data, to process data, to make it, you know, usable. And as a data engineer, you know, you work on the cloud, you build pipelines. So it's very, very different. Uh, you work more on the on the back end. You work more on the back end. So that's the distinction di distinction I want to make. So to answer your question, uh, as a beginner in the IT field, so once again, if you picture IT um, as the back office, maybe, and the business team is in the front office, and you as a data professional is probably in the middle office, um, you can take IT as your supplier because IT is the guardian of the database. If you look at any software, any application, it is the UI plus the database. Now UI is at the front end and the database is in the back end, right? So you understand that's where you capture data. I mean, the database. So IT, um, they are the guardians of the data, but they are not the user of the data. And the business teams are the user of the data. But the data, in its raw form is not usable. You know, there's a lot, it's very hairy, very messy. And business team, they're not technical. They don't know how to, what to do with it. You know, like take a terabytes of data and they have no idea, you know, how, how to use it. So that's why, and there is a middle layer and we create lots of uh, data jobs. So IT is your supplier as a data uh, professional and business team is your customer. And I think if you see the, the upstream and downstream, all of a sudden you understand um, the work and also the work environment and the relationship you know, between you and IT and between you and the business team. And that is actually what makes your job uh, valuable because a lot of times you see uh, huge gaps between the technical team and the business team, and your role is to close that gap. So I, I, I hope this is clear to you. I think if you position yourself as the kind of uh, professional who are good at closing gaps, and, and then um, your job will be very safe. <laughs> You'll be in high demand. Okay, another question. I have quite a number of years as a data analyst and my work experience indicates I have the required skills. And the project I have worked with a company data and I cannot share, you know, I, I understand that. Um, on a public space as creating a portfolio, what do you advise? Okay. Um, in fact, there are many options for you to create a portfolio and you don't need that many projects. So over here, you can see this individual, um, she only includes one and two and three projects. Um, but this is only the second page. Uh, the second page is the portfolio or maybe the work center. 
And she actually has a portfolio website. So if you click on the, uh, the link, you go to the website, you will see probably six or seven projects that she uh, has built. In fact, uh, these two experience, you know, our consulting experience uh, through Beam Data. Beam Data is part of we call data. So none of these two projects are here. So she only showcased the portfolio project. Now, all the portfolio project use, um, I wouldn't say open data, but not confidential uh, company data. So it's okay to show those, all right? So I think um, one space you can come is with our data. And we, over the years, we have uh, collected uh, so many uh, use cases and every single use case has data. And we have our own you know, uh, data environment. Everything is on the cloud. And you can do project with us and all of the portfolio project. Um, and because the project itself is not creating value. Uh, so um, we're not paying you to do this project. Otherwise, the real client project over here, um, you, some of the students actually get paid if the clients pay us. And this experience is good to show on the resume, but you cannot show uh, the actual project. I hope I an answer your question. Um, on embassy. So you can still find a way. You know, one way is to come to Wicca Data and we can help you um, build the portfolio. Right. So, Edwin, my goal is to become a machine learning engineer. However, it seems I must pick up the skills of the data analyst and a bit of data scientist. For example, when it comes to cleaning, collecting, storing and manipulating data before processing it. You're absolutely right. So Edwin, as I said before, DA, DS, NLE, they actually have the same foundational uh, skills. Um, like you said, data preparation, making data work for the organization. Uh, that is something very time consuming least exciting, but I'm telling you, these are the things, these are the boring things, but if you look around the best data scientists and the best data engineer, or maybe the best uh, data analyst, they are all very good at the boring stuff, which is data management skill, or how to deal with um, uh, all kinds of data issues, right? And these are the things, you know, uh, all these data professionals share. Uh, in fact, to tell you the truth, um, we have reformed, you know, our uh, data camp. Um, now, everyone, doesn't matter if you register for DA or DS or DE program, all of you have to go through data fundamental courses. So you learn SQL, you learn, you learn Python. You also learn uh, data visualization. Um, but from there, you can branch out. You can keep building the depth, or you can um, build the, the, the range. You can go wide, you can go deep. And so you, you, you can become a business intelligence professional or become a data, science, data scientist and data engineer. But in a nutshell, I think you probably know that already. A data engineer probably will spend more time coding, right? And a data scientist will spend more time training the model using Python. A data analyst or business intelligence consultant will spend more time building the dashboard. Um, but the foundation, the foundational skills, for instance, uh, SQL uh, or database management uh, or Python, pandas, you know, once again, just data wrangling uh, skills are the same, are the same. So um, if you start with data fundamental, um, it's 
doesn't matter where you go, you need it. So you can't go wrong with data fundamental. Okay. All right, so I think I get these questions clear. The picture again? Oh, which one? Uh, so if you guys want to take a, a snapshot of this picture, please do so. And Robin, with the understand we can't know any uh, everything, but do you, how do we show we can rapidly pick up and learn how to use the tool? That's a great question too. <laughs> Um, you see, nowadays, I'll give you two examples. So one of the students um, is having an interview and obviously, um, you know, he didn't learn Databrick, um, but the job description clearly requires him to know Databrick. Uh, it's not must have, but it's nice to have. Uh, but this happened all the time. You look at the qualifications, um, there are six, I meet only four, or maybe I meet only three. Um, some of you feel very uncomfortable and, and you don't apply at all. But I encourage everyone, if you meet 40% of the requirements, the job requirements, apply, apply anyway. I can tell you there's no perfect candidate who knows everything on that list. And if there is one, you know, he probably is very demanding. We'll ask, uh, we'll ask for a lot <laughs> in, in the salary. Um, it's very I likely. I love to. I love to learn, right? So yeah. learning tools is easy. I'm learning Tableau right now just to make sure I've got it to a level of depth that I need, right? Yeah. But a question I ask is, if you get somebody who's got 100% of the qualifications, are you seriously thinking that they're going to want to move? I probably will not. Will not pick that. They're already doing just for more money. Almost yeah. everybody wants to learn, right? Yeah. So the question is, how do we demonstrate that I can learn a tool? The tool's the easy part, right? Yeah. Learn, knowing the business and knowing and understanding how to interact with people is re are really the important skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how to get across to people. I, look, so, I'll, I'll be I'll be clear here, right? I'm 53 years old. I'm struggling. The same. To, <laughs> I'm struggling to even get an interview because if I put I've put 15 years of my experience on there, which doesn't cost the half of what I've done, but they look at me and it's like too old, I think, because I'm not even getting a response or sorry, you don't fit. And that's it. I mean, I'm talking about a hundred jobs I've applied for and I haven't managed to get in the door. Finally today, I got somebody because I reached out to people, I reach out to people on LinkedIn to recruiters and sorry, to hiring managers and say, can I spend 10 minutes with you and just check and see whether this would be a fit or not? I'm lucky if I even get a response, but today I got one. That's the first time in nine months. It's that bad. And I'm in Seattle. So Yeah. yeah. So I, I like to tell you that um, a lot of times hiring manager uh, will look at the team. I don't want, I, I don't expect, I don't expect each one of them has all the skills, but I, I'm expecting the team has all the skills required. And ideally, I have the team of people uh, with complementary skill set, right? And um, I don't know if you watched the movie, um, I think, Intern, um, played by Robert De Niro. <laughs> um, I still remember, remember he, he, he is, he is old fashioned and you know he wanted to, go to a startup uh, working for young people. And when he record the cover letter <laughs> in video, he, he said this, he said, um, I, I have been a company man all my life. You know, uh, I'm, I'm reliable, uh, I'm good in crisis. Now, he, he, when you hear this, this is, this is actually, these are the qualities it's it's not easy to find um you know in most of the people so for your case you you wouldn't want to compete <laughs> uh, for, in, for instance the the, the 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 latest technology you wouldn't want to compete um, with other people on that but you definitely have your own strengths um 
To answer your question, how do I show the employer my learning agility? You know, if it is required, I'm going to pick it up real quick. And sometimes I, I, I encourage the students to say, you know what, if you need this, you can tell the employer, um, I'm going to get certified for this, you know, before I start. Yeah. So you can tell people, uh, this is quite common and quite normal. And every company has a different technology stack, right? It's impossible for you to nerd it off, to have all the answers before you even start looking. And nobody is expecting that. So this question, you know, with a bit of thinking, I think you can come up with a fairly good story um, to handle that. And as long as you make people feel comfortable and you will pick it up, um, they know that it's not hard to find experts, but it's very hard to find a really capable people who can get things done, right? That's more important. And once again, interview is very strange. <laughs> it's between people and people are emotional. So sometimes it's not the person with um, the strongest hard skill, you know, will win the job. It's it's probably the runner up. <laughs> who who has the, the the best attitude? You know, it's just such a good person, a good personality to work with. You know, it, it's that. <laughs> okay, so when it's fair to zoom, you will begin to learn something new as soon as you get hired. Um, well. The, the ability, uh, let me tell you this. And the second thing is, if you don't know the answer already, you know, you can find the answer very quickly. And it's a basic skill that you can Google around, you can ask, and you, you, you will do everything and anything to find the answer real quick. Uh, if you show, if you demonstrate people you have that, I think people will feel pretty comfortable. They, they were not, um, dwell on this topic and they will move on to a different question. You know, I'm pretty sure on that. Okay, so let me just go through this. Okay, so guys, I'm going to show, show you this. Um, this is psychology. Um, most of the job seekers may have the imposter syndrome because you haven't done this, right? You're an outsider and trying to get in. So um, it's pretty easy for you know me as a mentor. I can I can just convince the students. Oh, just put this on your resume. You will get interview. It's easy to get interview, but you can't handle the interview, and that's the problem, right? So when you look at this, th this is just a very typical um, writing block to put on your resume and to convince the hiring manager that you have uh, the ability to succeed in CRM, on customer relationship management. So this is a bigger uh, space. And then specifically digital marketing and more specifically email campaign, all right? Email campaign is still very popular. So if you go through this real quick, um, this is not just BS, but this is very specific, I, I think, these are very good six bullet points. Uh, I'm just using this to make a point. So this is the relationship of working with marketers and engineers to design and execute email campaign, generate leads and drive sales. So um, even business people can understand this, right? And you cover end-to-end -end process. That means you work from the beginning to the end, uh, from list generation to campaign ex uh, execution, performance measurement. And um, once again, this is not technical, even business people can understand. And then specifically, you uh, your job is to generate a targeted email list based on business rule. And uh, this is a, 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 some of you probably know this do not call us. And this is CASL, this is in Canada, Canadian anti-span legislation regulations. And um, in the US, you have something similar. And then segment the email list based on demographic behavior and preference characteristics. And chances are you have three data sets, one demographic, one 
behavior and preference. And, and for personalized content, now, this is an experimentation. Use a random seed to divide the email list into control and test group and use AB email created. So you may use different chapter, different, 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 you know, yeah, body of the email, different call to action. Uh, so this is where the marketers can become creative, but they don't know which one works better. So they need you to test, right? To determine what works and what doesn't. Uh, um, I think this is just one bullet that shows you understand <laughs> A-B testing or experimentation. And the last one, define KPIs, so open rate, click rate, conversion rate, to measure email campaign uh, performance, improve ROI, and return on investment, and reduce cost of activity. This is essentially what a email campaign you know, um, will do. You know? And if you do these things right, and the email campaigns uh, will be successful. So if you want to do a screenshot, go ahead. Um, but the problem is, the, the psychology is this. I know this kind of experience can get me an interview, but you know, I, I, I have never done it, right? So if I put this on my resume, I feel like a fraud, and I, 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 I will fear, you know, me being caught. Um, so this is the problem we need to solve. Um, there's no other way. You just need to do it. You, you either, you know, come to the to to reach our data, and then we put you uh, to work on a uh, portfolio project, or well, and if you want. Uh, you can work on a real kind of project. So you will you will do the work, you know, before you even uh, look for that kind of work, right? So everything you write on the resume and you you can back it up. And you feel very comfortable if you're very confident. Um, you are not worried. You're not afraid of you know people asking you questions about this. You you actually want them to ask because you have prepared for that. And you want people to ask you about this part of the experience, and you have prepared and practiced over and over how to deliver a, a good performance, right? So this is something I want you to understand. You know, there's no other way. You just have to do it, and not just the, some sort of toy project, but um, industry grade professional quality. All right. Uh, robust training. And so this is where I want to, once again, uh, make the distinction between uh, skill-based and robust. Um, so this, I, 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 I simplify email campaign into this, but you can still see, um, you can um, use um, some SQL query to go through the entire process. Uh, but this is much simplified, but at least you can still see, you know, how you um, design the campaign, how you execute it, how you measure the performance of the campaign. But once you do this, even a simple case like this, after you do this, you will feel so much more comfortable, okay? So the role-based training is to simulate the work environment, the work and the people you will be working with, the relationship, so you can learn the skills in that context. And you can produce the professional work samples to demonstrate, to show the learning outcomes. You can even build a project portfolio to showcase the skills that uh, the employers are looking for. So that way um, you will get interviews and you will also have a lot to talk about um, during the interview so you can pass the interview. I hope I, hope I get my... Uh, my idea across. Let me run a check. So we have another hour. Let me go to the next one. Okay. So the um, <laughs> so this is also a what is it? Um, catch twenty two, right? Um, the job or the experience? Which one? Which one happened first? And in fact, this it's not it's not just that. Um, you know, a lot of times you see the job at or the job hosting requires a number of years. Um, I think recruiter um, like to do that um, because they cannot evaluate candidates based on 
expertise. They, they, they don't know how to recognize the expertise. So they use a simple measure like number of years. That is a horrible, that is a terrible matrix because the quality of the experience cannot be measured by a number of years, right? So I like to you know, show you the difference between expertise and experience. You want to show people expertise, not number of years, because there is a difference. So expertise is skill acquired from actual practicing. And experience is skills implied. And so if you work in this industry for five years, you must know something. But that's very shaky, right? And in my humble opinion, the relevant expertise from three months of booking practicing with laser focus can easily be three years of irrelevant experience. And sometimes this go up to six. So if you do both training and uh, a real kind project, it's, it's gonna be uh, six months. That's very, very solid. And you have a lot to show, not just the portfolio. You will, uh, we will drill you on coding skills and you will pass the coding test and you will have a good portfolio to show people, all right? Um, so this is about data analysis. I'm going to skip this, this too. Okay, so I want to talk about this for a bit. Um, how to learn up to get a job. So with similar year role, how you perform the task in the context of function process business industry, how you communicate up or down across the organization to get the job done. So this is a very interesting picture. A lot of times we just focus on this role and that's not right. In fact, the job description is written out of context. It's impossible for people to understand this job by just reading the job description. So we have to zoom out. We have to zoom out to see how this role fits into this big picture. So for instance, you know, um, if this is a dot, right, we need to understand these two lines, the horizontal line called process and the vertical line called function. Um, in most companies, the organization, okay, have a copy of the presentation, Rosie? Yes, um, I encourage you to uh, send an email to, to, to Adam Shing, and um, I will email you this presentation in PDF. Okay, okay, so back here. So this is a vertical line. I think if you look at the organizational chart, in most organizations, um, it's um, boxes and lines. Uh, it's vertical because everybody has a boss and it's all vertical. But if you think, if you think about this, you will go, this is not how uh, we get the job done. Because if you want to get the job done, it always, always involves a process and process is horizontal. So meaning, you will need to work across functions. You will need to work with people from different teams or from different departments. So this where I need you to understand both function so you can get support from your boss and you can get more resources to work on it. So if one a person is not enough, maybe you get two people, right? But you need your boss to approve it. Or horizontally, you know your supplier is IT and your customer is the business team. And um, whether or not the IT team deliver the data and deliver the data on time or deliver good data is going to affect your output, you know, your deliverable to the business team, right? So somehow you will have to make sure this person does his job so you can you know, do your job and deliver value to uh, the end user, right? So th even this is not enough. To define a role, 
you will need to understand both function and process. Even this is not enough. You still need to look at the whole business and how we make money, right? What are the core uh, processes? Uh, what are the most critical decisions we need to make? So speaking of work, there are three levels of work and uh, here is the hierarchy of work. Uh, I call them uh, over here. What is it? Oh, it's not here. Uh, but I can tell you it's strategy and tactics and operations. So you have CEO at the top and he has a grand vision and everything is at a strategic level, very high level, right? And, and, and long-term. And you also have middle managers and um, they make technical decisions um, that has uh, meet uh, maybe short-term consequences. And you also have uh, employees in the business team who are running day-to-day, uh, -day, right? Uh, you know, um, and they're also making decisions at a more detailed level. So you will need to understand the three levels of work and using data to support decisions at three levels. So once again, without understanding of the business and the functions and the process, uh, it's impossible for you to understand this world. And sometimes you even need to step out of the business uh, so you can understand the competition in the industry, right? And if it's a global business, it's even more complicated. But I'm trying to say you need to zo uh, zoom out and then zoom in again and so you can understand this world you know, from outside in. And that also gives you a lot of good material um, to, to, to um, you know, write stories and to um, design a conversation for an interview. So these are the things we will help the students understand. And not just you know, the technical things, but also on the business side, you will need to develop uh, some domain knowledge. Okay, so going to the next picture. Uh, so this is just a uh, one example for the DABI bookend. Um, I'm trying to show you the skills and also the use cases. Um, sometimes people ask me this question, uh, Eric, uh, which tool is more useful? Uh, SQL or Python? You know, which one is more useful? Um, this is like, you know, me asking you, which tool is more useful, uh, fork and knife or chopsticks? I, I, I think you will say, Eric, that's a dumb question because the answer really depends on the problem you're trying to solve. If, if you want to eat meatballs, probably you can use a fork. And if you want to eat instant noodles or ramen, you can use chopsticks. Right, precisely. So I'm not saying the tools are not important, but I think the use cases are more important. In fact, we need to work backwards. We need to understand the use cases first and then decide uh, which tools we're gonna use. And every single tool, even Excel, it's impossible for you, know, for you to know all the features. Right, but we only need to learn enough. We only need to learn the twenty percent essential skill to solve the use case. So we'll need to let the use case drive the skill development, and that's something I really want to get across. If you get this clear, you will you'll feel relieved because you don't need to learn everything. You only need to learn enough to do a very specific job in a very specific industry. But of course, you want to cover more ground. So probably you will do uh, a use case in FinTech, a use case in e-commerce, supply chain, CRM, and, and there will be more. But that's why you want to have seven or eight projects and then maybe put 
six on their resume, uh, you know, with a target industry. Uh, so this is how we developed the learning path. And this is also why you could finish it, you know, within three to six months with laser focus. We don't, um, I'm trying to say what not to learn is almost important as what to learn. Uh, we are being very selective, okay? So our approach is very different from, um, I don't want to name names, um, the online um, resources, um, because they're trying to teach you everything. And you know it's not possible. And it's also very basic. Now, after five, six weeks, and you start forgetting, you know? And uh, after a couple months, is you 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 still feel empty and it's like you never learn anything you 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 never had it before right and if you learn the skills in the use cases it's very hard to forget because you remember this the the, the tools the skills by the problems you solve you know I hope I get this idea across and you will feel much much better if you let the use cases to drive you. If they're helpful, I am for you. Um, Robbie, are you asking any um, special program? Well, I mean, hey. so I got I got laid off in uh, January, and I picked up a contract, and I've been working in fintech. But honestly, I'm like, I'm trying to support a family and figure out how to get a more permanent job than just contract yeah so it's like so if, if somebody turns around to me there's, there's plenty of courses out there right but it's like it's six thousand dollars and it's like <laughs> buy we have, and pay out six thousand dollars we have payment plans we have payment plans so you um for people who pay everything up front there will be discount but if you want to use the payment plan there will be no discount, but you can pay in maybe you know, three or four installments. Um, in Canada, we also work with the banks. Um, so some banks provide nine credit for, for learning. Um, you're in Seattle, you mentioned. Probably. Yes, correct. Yeah. 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 In the US, we once worked with, I think, two, um, two providers. Uh, but we have to, we need another conversation. You know, uh, our CFO knows more details about you know, our uh, financing partner in the US, but are, uh, uh, any, anything is available to suit your situation. So we can talk about that offline. Okay, thank you, appreciate that. You're welcome. But how much for the bookend? Um, very, very high level, BI bookend, um, the live bookend is 7,000 Canadian, and DS, data science, is 15,000, and DE, I believe, is 12,000, but don't quote me. Um, the program advisors may have um, the exact number you know, um, for, the, for, the, for the cost, for the, for the discount, and for, for, for the time. Um, but I want you to remember that we're about to launch the recorded bookend with TA support, with mentor support. That's a lot cheaper. That's probably half the price. And I think it's a very good deal um, because it's the same instructor and they take the time to record the bookend. And I think about the student sitting in the live class, but don't ask any question at all. Um, and it's not so much different um, from just watch, watching the recording video. Uh, and plus, you have a lot more hours with the TA to ask specific questions, you know, unique to your situation, right? Um, okay, so I hope I get the idea across. Uh, the skills plus experience, and you will be able to, okay. So I like to, so this is business analysis or product management. Uh, it's all about how to make money in this business, the core cool process, key decision, and the goal and an objective, 
Um, so this is what I mentioned, the three levels of hierarchy um, in the work design, the strategies, tactics, and operations. So these are the these 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 things are not hard at all, uh, but it's it's common sense, and we just need to uh, we, we need you to work with the mentor so you can learn the other half. It's not just all technical, and it's also business. So we will need to understand the business um, for 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 you to have a clear sense of purpose. In fact, depending on your background. We have people coming from STEM background, you know, engineering, science, math. Um, they oftentimes do a very good job if you give very clear uh, instruction. Um, but the, the 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 weakness is they don't have a good sense of purpose why they are doing what they are doing, and they don't know the big picture. You know. um, but when they need to work with the business team. And they often go quiet because they, they don't know, you know how to communicate with them. You know? and sometimes they feel the business team talk over them. Uh, uh, but sometimes they feel also the business don't know anything and they know a lot about the technical side of it. And so they are arrogant, but I mean, <laughs> you're arrogant. But at the same time, you, you, you don't feel um, you or maybe you feel underappreciated. So this kind of feelings I completely understand because I work with both business and data team. But for you to really take a balanced approach to uh, learning, uh, you need to develop uh, some really important, you know, uh, business analysis skill. Uh, you don't need to go to business school. You don't need an MBA to really understand how uh, to make money you know, in a business. Uh, so th th these are the things I think uh, sometimes is even more important before you get down in the weeds and, and do the actual work. But on the contrary, we have people coming from business background, finance, accounting, economics, or even humanity. Um, they communicate well, they know the big picture, they, they can work with business team, no problem, but they lack the depth. Um, so they need to work harder on coding skill. Uh, I'm trying to say nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. We all have our weakness. Uh, we just need to contain the weakness. So we have a balanced approach to this job. And we can show people that um, we're at that a rare combination of business and data and communication. And then you know people people will trust you or will, will have confidence in you. Okay, Rosie, what email I should okay. I'm going to send you my email maybe. Okay, you can send me your email and I will send you the PDF. And even better, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me. Uh, we can talk about you know, your situation and, and your next move. Okay, from Edwin, I, I thank the few individuals who you know, um, participate in this discussion. It's always better if it's two-way. Uh, I find data analysts boring, <laughs> really. And the uh, machine learning engineer and data engineer were interesting and challenging and rewarding, but it seems the AI is fundamental to become, uh, what do you suggest I do? Okay. Uh, it's very personal. Um, I personally find uh, data analysis and business intelligence interesting too. Uh, once again, I use uh, the pyramid, right? So you see a lot of business um, in terms of um, AI, they're not there yet. They have more problems at a very basic fundamental level. So for instance, basic questions like, you know, what happened, what is going on, um, why, 
they can't even get these questions answered. I'm trying to say there are a lot more low-high inputs <laughs> that requires business analysts, business intelligence consultant uh, to solve. Uh, the reason I think business intelligence is interesting is because um, business intelligence or visual storytelling, it is very visual. It is very visual. And that is how um, most people within an organization um, talk to each other and communicate with each other. So if you know how to run queries and create tables and reports, that's very, very basic. And if you take this to the next level, if you know how to build a VR solution, a, a dashboard that is dynamic, interactive, people can play with it because it's visible and because everybody is using it and because people at all levels are using it, you know, uh, including the C-level uh, VPs and managers and the employees. And then you become very, very visible. I consider that the fast track for career development. I don't know if you get my point. Every VP and director probably need a go-to person and you can be that person, you know? You can help your boss or maybe even your boss's boss to communicate with their boss, you know? And that way you can connect yourself to the people with power and with opportunity. So that is just one best way for you to work with business people because everybody needs you, okay? Uh, but you're right. Uh, Data engineering and machine learning engineering, they probably, uh, these roles may earn more. I have seen machine learning engineer, engineer making uh, 150K, even more, 200K. And I have seen them um, stay in Canada, but you know, work for American company, get paid in US dollar. And somehow they get the best of both worlds. <laughs> And I, I don't know, maybe if you work in Montreal, uh, the housing is more affordable, but you know, you get paid a lot more, you know, compared to other jobs in Canada. Um, so those are definitely good opportunities you should pursue. Okay, go down. What is the percentage of your students from jobs in DA after book camp? Okay, and I can talk about DS first and then uh, DABI. Uh, our DS bookend um, has been rated uh, very, very top uh, throughout the year. And even the Ministry of um, Colleges and University, um, you can check out, you can find our ranking. Um, it's 90.9. And within six months after graduation. And for BI program, um, it's go apart. It's around 83, 85. Um, it is a good ratio. And I want to assure you, um, we got data and all our employees were measured by that KPI. And it's the kind of KPI you don't usually have um, for universities. I mean, if you graduate from university, eventually you'll find a job. So some universities say they have 100% placement rate, but we define placement rate as you know, how fast you find a job. So if you find uh, a data well, you know, within six months uh, of graduation from our book and that counts into the numerator. And so for a longest time, that is our goal. And that also helps uh, with our uh, enrollment, you know, get new students from Canada and US. You can even have them fund your education to further develop your career. Rosie, do you have any advice on transition um, business analysts to data analysts? Which skill and knowledge do I need to pick up and leverage? I'm currently working as a VA system 
a name where I give up configure and work with production data every day. Rosie is interesting. You work in that row, BA or BSA, business analyst, business system analyst. And business system analyst, you probably stay in IT, but you need to work with business for sure. Um, remember, the other um, participant mentioned product management. So BA and product management are more or less the same. It's all about um, bridging the gap between business and uh, technology. Um, you're in a very unique position, just like a data analyst. Data analyst is also working between business and technology. For your role, is more about um, maybe system or software development. Um, you can stay where you are, you don't move, uh, or you can move to the data space. <laughs> Both are good. There's no good or bad. Um, but given that, I think most of you have heard of uh, AI and how we can use AI to uh, change the, the way we work. Um, we haven't talked about this, but I think this is important for everybody to realize. Um, AI or BI AI is about building our brain and becoming smarter, right? Software development, application development is like arms and legs. So it's about execution, you know, do things. I think both brain and arms and necks are important. Um, but depending on your preference, so I personally believe um, it's harder for you to get your foot out. For instance, uh, if you're a BA and you want to become a developer, it might be harder. You can continue working as a BA. And I have known some BA who earn a very, very high rate. A lot of them are contractors. Um, but you will need to be really good with, you know, uh, both worlds, business and IT. So somehow you will need to pick up some programming, you will need to understand business. Um, once again, it's closing gaps. But for data, it, it, it's a little bit different. I think um, it's business usual. It is also project work, you can't close. Whereas working as a BA or BSA, I think it's um, it's more stressful because uh, most of the time it's project based, and sometimes as a BA or BSA, a BSA, you 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 will do testing too. You, know, you work as a QA. Uh, and I, I have seen sometimes you will need to get up uh, three o'clock in the morning, or sometimes you're on call and you need to wear a pager maybe uh, on weekends. Uh, if and that's something you don't want. You want a more stable or even the privilege of working from home. I think um, the ABI uh, is a good choice. Okay, uh, can we talk about the uh, DevOps bootcamp, okay, please? Um, DevOps. <laughs> um, I'm not an expert on DevOps, but I can talk about it very, very briefly. <clears throat> so. We call data actually has uh, the strengths uh, because we have um, three brands. We have recall data, we have beam data. So beam data is our consulting consulting firm. And uh, for the longest time, we work with uh, Mars, we work with Communitech, and both are incubators in uh, in Toronto and in Kitchener Waterloo area. Uh, but since last year, we expanded into uh, in, to US. So we have um, big clients from the US. So we started to get um, very significant, uh, significant contract work. And those are real client projects. So uh, for DevOps, I think you will learn uh, the framework in you know, how, how we can, you know, 
um, run development and operations as one function. And it is actually in very high demand. Um, from the industry where I came from, um, I worked in the bank industry for 25 years. So release control, release management is like taking a train. <laughs> if you miss a train, you will need to wait maybe several weeks to catch the next train. But I think nowadays you have seen the tech firm. Um, they can release, they can release, I don't know, maybe uh, hundreds um, times a day. It's as simple as the press of the button. So DevOps is definitely the future. Um, it, it, it has to be very, very, you know, uh, flexible and frequent. And it's impossible for development and operation to work separately. So they have to be combined and refer to the same boss. So you will need to pick different skills, um, a little bit of everything. Um, but I think every student, depending on your uh, background or your previous um, work history, some are very strong, um, um, you know, uh, support, some are very strong on um, deployment. And you, you, you just need to, um, once again, con contain your request. And we have very good instructors from um, some of the best firms, um, you know, the, the, the big names. Um, we also have Beam Data, where you can do really good project to, to build your resume and to get interviews. And we also have uh, the third brand, which is We Career, and we will pair you up with some of the best DevOps experts um, we find in Canada and the US. And they will help with your job search, you know, resume, interview, script, interview, practice. So it's, this is how much I can tell you. Um, I'm not a DevOps expert, but if you require, I can connect you to Nat, um, who is the program manager of DevOps, and you can have a conversation. Well, front and back end, <laughs> I think our program uh, focuses more on back end. So the same back end you can use to power AI or to power a uh, software application. <clears throat> Rosie, why DevOps has become so popular compared to other platforms? Um, DevOps is not a platform, it's how you organize. Um, the, have you heard of um, SDLC, uh, Software Development Lifecycle? So if you remember the Software, the software Development Lifecycle, um, it happened in stage, right? So starting from analysis and then development and then acceptance and then production, right? So you see um, people working in different roles. So analysis, uh, Rosie, you're the BA, and development, and we have developers. And then acceptance, you have QA uh, doing the UAT. And after, after that, you can uh, release to production. And you have a separate team doing uh, maintenance and support. Uh, so that's ops. Uh, now DevOps, we want to uh, put them all together, one team, <laughs> one team doing everything uh, from beginning to the end. So that is a big change in terms of um, uh, organizational design. Um, that also has very positive impact uh, on you know, how we manage the releases. So if you have heard of I think um, continuous integration, uh, continuous um, uh, integrate integrate testing, integrate. Um, so, so you can you can you can do multiple releases a day. So it's much much easier. Uh, that's basically how you manage the SDLC. All right. 
So let me do a time check. So 9.35. Let me just keep going. OK, so this is a business intelligence that I want to show you. So this is data analysis. And this is the boring part. Pre-processing, EDA, uh, summary statistics. So where you find a, 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 the, the weird situation, data is used in the treatment. And then ETL is very, very typical. Uh, entity relationship diagram, this is extremely important uh, data modeling skill. Okay, so this is the boring stuff, but it's actually the most important foundational skill. So this is business intelligence. We said in God we trust, all other others must bring data. So then um, it is the same thing we'll talk about, dimensions to measure, trends and drivers, conclusions and recommendations. And then you want to visualize the value creation uh, and you can talk about revenue growth, cost reduction, efficiency gain, quality improvement. So I'm going to show you a very short video clip so you can see uh, the work of our student. And this is um, a capstone project. Um, it almost looked like an application. It, it's really, really cool. It's very, very well designed. Very well built. <laughs> And by the way, um, this is um, using SQL Server Management Studio and Azure SQL Database and together with Power BI, okay? Yeah. So then uh, the weekly alumni mentorship support. So all the program we have is um, um, with career support. What we do, we invite our successful students back and we ask them to support our new generation of students. We actually pay them. We pay them $50 an hour. Uh, and then we pair you with the successful anonymous uh, one-on-one. -on -one. So they can help you with your positioning strategy, job search strategy, um, resume building, interviews, scripting your interview practice um, until you find jobs. And we promise people if you don't give up on yourself, then we will not give up on you until you find a job. Um, we also run um, career sessions in a group so you feel a sense of community. And we also build the community with the hiring partners. So from time to time, we have referral opportunities. So we can fast track your resume to uh, the employer and we'll put your resumes in the hands of the hiring manager uh, through the back door. So instead of competing with 300 people, you probably uh, compete with um, five, or, five or six people. So at least you get uh, interviews so you can get better at interviewing. And all we do is to make you work with the team to increase your chances. We never guarantee job, but I think everything is possible if you work with the team instead of, you know, on your own. And I like to stress that, you know, the, the things that make you stand out um, sometimes are hard to learn uh, on your own by yourself. So you can significantly increase your chances if you work with good mentors. Plus, good mentors, they have been there and done that. They know the insider information. They have the resources, and they have the connection that you can leverage. OK, Rosie. Um, yeah. Thank you. Good to know it's a term that my client uses Azure DevOps. So whenever the team prefers to DevOps, I mean, OK. All right. So this is something I want to stress. Um, this is one thing we train our students to do and do to do really, really well. Um, most people realize that um, every single job on the job board attracts 300 to 500 people. But here's the deal. 
now the employer or the hiring manager becomes smarter. And it's called code fight before resume fight. So if they screen you based on the resume, chances are um, they will filter out some really good candidates, but look very bad on the resume. So what they do, they usually send everybody a task package. It's usually some coding questions and plus a business case with data. So I want to tell you what we experienced indirectly through the students. So the bad news, here's the bad news. The typical job attracts 500 resume. And the first step of the selection process is always a technical test. Almost every company does that to screen so many resumes and there's no way around it. So this is the bad news. And the good news is the survey of the hiring managers shows that only one out of 10 responds to the technical test. All our students will take the test and pass it. So if you can take the test and pass it, you effectively reduce the competition by 90%. That is very good news. The more good news is we cut data, we curate the real technical test from the employer. Over the years, we have collected so many. And it is good to take the test to expose your weakness. So we drill you, we grind you, and you will, you know, we use coding workshops to, 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 to help you uh, find your weak list. And you will repeat and you will do the test to keep you sharp and keep you warm. And um, you, you, you will stay sharp. So you can go to the employer's technical test um, at any moment. So our students, they will always pass this first round. Uh, so in order to meet the higher manager, or probably the second round will be the screening by HR, uh, which is a lot easier. And so here are the several strategies. Um, you can go deep or you can go wide, okay? And data science or data engineering is go deep and DABI is go wide. And both are okay. And I think I clarified this, data is not IT. You're not becoming a developer of programmers, but you're becoming engineers. So nowadays you have heard uh, engineers. It sounds like um, a, a job with an engineer in it uh, always make more money, which is you know true to some extent. Um, but if you have consultant in your um, in your role, you can also make good money. But that's more on the business side. Um, so instead of analyst, you can be a consultant. So instead of developer, you can be an engineer. Um, what do I do with that? And this is specific to the ABI jobs. Um, do I run queries and create reports all day? And uh, that's probably the case like <laughs> 15 years ago, but not anymore. So now on um, DABI, um, we build dashboards. We, we, we develop BI solutions to maybe automate or replace uh, tens and hundreds of reports. So now you probably only need five dashboards to meet all needs um, from the business team. So there are a very, very high profile projects you can participate in. And all of those have significant impact on the business outcome. Uh, I think I answered this question as well. Uh, do I have the advantage in, uh, with your STEM background? Not necessarily. You may be good at you know, coding, but you will need to pick up uh, other skills. And for people coming from the FAE background, finance, accounting, business, and economics, then you will need to work harder on coding um, but I think you want to play your strengths in terms of business analysis and business intelligence and communication back to the business um, to, to showcase you know, the benefits. And three stages of going nowhere. 
Um, these are the three black hole you will want to get out of. Otherwise, it will leave you hanging forever. The first one is learning forever without a focus. This is really, really bad. The more you learn, the less you feel you know, and the less confident you become. And there's so much to learn. But you know what? You need to make a distinction between learning to get a job and learning to do the job. You are learning to get a job first. So before you master the skill that will help you get a job, you're wasting your time doing anything else. So going back to how much is enough? So I think you will just need to learn just enough to pass the tests and interview and get a job. Because you don't even know what kind of job you will get and in what industry. And after you get a job, uh, you still need to learn, right? But it becomes very, very accurate and specific. And now I think you will need to, for, B, for DABI job, you will need to be really good at SQL coding. And if you um, want to become a data scientist, um, uh, Python is extremely important. And Python pandas is, is important. And the other packages, you just need to know when to use what. But foundational skills, pandas, NumPy, you will need to be really good because you'll be tested on it. So as long as, as long as you get that, you should move on and you know try to get interviewed. So the second black hole is you don't get interviews. It's like, you know, doesn't matter how many jobs you apply for, it's like it's shouting into a black hole. Um, you never hear back from the jobs you apply for. So these are the things that our mentor can help. And we'll, we will help you figure out what's wrong. And did you apply enough? Did you apply for the right jobs? Did you apply uh, the old, the jobs that are too old? Um, did you disqualify yourself before others disqualify you? So these kind of uh, pitfalls, so uh, traps, uh, will help you avoid. But the idea, the idea is to get you um, as many interview opportunities as possible um, by you applying um, every day, or also through referral opportunity. And the third one is can't pass interview. So this is where you can work with the mentor and sit down and predict the questions that the interviewers will most likely ask you, and then create and write down the perfect story to uh, show the best side of you, right? So imagine if that interview is just one hour, I think it's totally manageable. And if you know ahead of time what is coming, right? And you can't predict every question, but you probably can predict 70, 60% of the question. And then that will make you feel a lot more comfortable and confident to improvise on the spot. So we'll do everything with you to increase your chances so you can pass in interviews. And throughout this journey, if you are all alone by yourself, um, it's very easy to lose hope. But if you work with the mentor, the mentor will provide you with the feedback so you know you're on the right, right track and you will keep going and want to go and get stuck. And eventually you will get better at interviewing. And compared to the people who set up for the first offer, and if you are patient, usually our students get a better job that pays more. Right. Um, instead of, you know, you settle with the first offer. Okay, let me check the time again. Ten more minutes to go. So uh, the rest is just a number of, you know, question and answer. I'm going to show you um, maybe one men mentee I work with. So you can see Gavin uh, is one of my mentees. Um, with his permission, I can show you. Uh, this not good news, so Rogers decline, declining him. 
So this is not from the beginning. We're using the free version of uh, Slack. So it keeps deleting the, the, the old um, message history. So I only have it uh, from July 31st. So this is not the beginning. We have we had already worked together for a while. Um, so it's, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> so then um, we move on. And we also try to um, understand um, where we can do better. So then uh, let me see, this might be another. Okay. Yeah, so another rejection, you know, it was um, taken by internal um, transfer. So this is actually the opportunity. Um, that, that eventually came true. So this is with government of Alberta and it's very strange. They asked for references even before the interview. So we gave, I was one of his reference. So we started to analyze the jobs. So as a mentor, I do what I am supposed to do. So I asked Gavin to give me all the details about the interviewer and the interview profile. Um, instead of me pulling the profile, um, I don't want to alert you know, the interviewer uh, that somebody is hoping uh, the, the, the mentee. The type of interview, the length of the interview, so we can strategize. So these are the people. And this is, and he's doing some research about the government website. And we started to understand uh, uh, what it means by linear property. So it turned out to be the industry property. And so in Alberta, you can understand probably pipeline, well, um, refinery, uh, equipment, um, you know, um, versus residential property, you have uh, houses and condos. Okay, let's keep going. I just want to show you how we work together. So number one and two, so he already wrote uh, the interview scripts, but we are trying to um, polish and make it better. What do you know about our company in this position? You need a story to answer. Why do you think you're qualified for this position? I added another question. Got it, I keep working on it. So I, I'm, I'm trying to improve the answer. So what do you think, uh, why do you think you're the perfect fit for this position? I came from engineering background and I have intern at ABB, uh, blah, 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 blah. You forgot to mention three approaches to property valuation. So these are the things we, we found and, and tried to put into the interview script. Keep going. Okay, so he came up the interview. He said that went pretty well. <laughs> uh, actually for several opportunities and Gavin felt very good about, it, but you know, he was already rejected by multiple companies. Oh, notice that he said, I cracked the director open when I mentioned I read the guideline, industry guideline. Um, I said, government documents are usually very dry and boring. Guess it's why he laughs. Okay, another opportunity, um, I think, with Cushman and Whitfield. So this is a big firm. Um, I want him to work on this in parallel. So we, I gave him a use case. Um, so this is a Canadian real estate investment trust. Real estate. So this is the um, same thing. We shortened the JD and we tried to prepare uh, for the interview. Uh, so this is a reference check. Um, I asked him to 
jot down the details for the reference to make it easy for uh, the reference to open. HR from GOE asked me to verify or uh, had a, uh, his academic degree. So that's a good sign. All right. So reference, reference. So this is with Cushman. Again, we are preparing for the real estate market analysis. So this is the seventh story we prepared for Cushman and Wickfield. API. You see, we work together very, very close. I think it's good news. Oh, um, the government of Alberta said they didn't receive the certificate from the school. So you have to arrange that. Okay, so eventually Gavin got the offer from the government of Alberta. And this is the backstory. So he said, um, uh, his job, the first week in, um, on the job, um, there's a senior uh, analyst you work with. He said the director uh, interviewed three people on that day. And Gavin was the only one who read the ministry guideline. And that's, remember, he mentioned the director laughed. So the senior told him, in fact, the director was quite impressed by Gavin, you know, how much, you know, extra mile he walked and how much he cared about this opportunity. Uh, and here is the hiccup. <laughs> so Gavin is a international student and he, I think apply for the work permit. And it turned out when the government of Alberta is doing uh, the check on his, um, you know, eligibility to work in Canada, it turned out he didn't have the work permit and he was so scared. So you realize it's not easy to really um, man the job and you need to work with so many people to avoid so many pitfalls. But Thank God he got hired. And one of the things, or maybe it could be the lesson learned is you need to research about the, the, the company or the, the, the employer and do everything you could. Um, you know, you're a student. So the hire manager call you for an interview uh, with an expectation. And it's your job to exceed his expectation to surprise him. Right. So in this case, Gavin talk about industry property evaluation, you know, how you appraise the land, how you can use one of the three approaches to evaluation. And he even talk about the three uh, methods uh, of depreciation, you know, um, a piece of uh, property. So all these skills. Um, you can, uh, not skills, all this knowledge you can pick up just by doing the research on top of your uh, technical assessment. So if you do just one thing, a little extra that people don't expect, and then you, it, it's just that little thing that make you uh, the, the, the winner. And when, in, when you're running the last mile, um, usually the candidates are all very competitive and very, very close. So the mentor will help you to do everything you could um, so you can deliver your, your peak performance uh, in the life or death um, you know, um, situation. And once again, um, finding a job involves different skills. Uh, so from training to doing consulting, a real kind project to looking for job. And every step of the way, we have TA, we have project mentor, we have career mentor working with you until you, 
you know, find your first job and start building your career. So uh, it's already 10, so I'm going to Um, okay, so for those of you, I probably didn't jot down all your email. I, I left my email. I need you to send me an email so I can just click reply back. Uh, I will send you the PDF. So please do that, and I will um, deliver on my promise. Okay, so thank you very much, and I hope you find the session formula and hope to uh, stay connected with all of you. So if you need to book me for a free consultation, do that. I'm not sales, I'm the program uh, director, um, but I genuinely you know, care about uh, the students and the mentees. Um, I believe you know, they're doing um, really, really good work and whatever we do, what we say, will have uh, an important effect on people and their career. Okay, so I'm going to, okay. Thank you, Tai Wu. So thank you, good night.